to welcome my friend and uh, mentor and blurber and all sorts of things, Jay Pasikoff, who in some ways is the reason that I'm here, uh, because his book, A Field Guide to the Stars and Planets, which I first read in 1984, I think it was in the second edition back then, I still have a copy, signed by Jay, uh, was the inspiration that really got me interested in astronomy <coughs> back in the 80s when I was a young preteen, and I maintained that ever since. So anybody who is, you know, for some people it makes them very happy that I got into astronomy because of him. Others may have, you know, you may have preferred a different conclusion. Uh, saying of Lane Jay. But uh, throughout that time, throughout the last uh, 30 plus years, uh, Jay has remained an influence on me, both for his scientific acumen and for his uh, just all around, I can't think of any other word, but menchusness. Menchusness, which Menschlichkeit. is a Mensch, Menschlichkeit, <laughs> Naomi, who is a renowned scholar in her own right, who's sitting up here in the front row, uh, who has uh, also uh, honored me by being a proofreader of my book. But these are the books uh, that are, have some relation to the talk today. One is a standard uh, astronomy um, textbook written with Alex Filipenko, a mutual friend of many people uh, in this room. And it describes uh, Jay uh, on the back, or it should have described him as the field pro memorial professor at Williams College, where he's been since 1972. Uh, and he's, of course, perhaps the world's foremost observer of astronomical phenomena, especially eclipses, transits, syzygies of all flavors, my favorite Scrapple word. Uh, and he is here on an auspicious day, because how many of you know what today marks the 100th anniversary of? That is right, the year that uh, Primo Levi was born. Very good. I'm very <laughs> impressed by you guys. No, no. It's actually the uh, centennial anniversary today of the famous Eddington eclipse, which total solar eclipse, which led to uh, confirmation of Einstein's theory of general relativity. So it's a very auspicious day that he's visiting. Depictions of the eclipse on both this astronomical uh, textbook for a course and also this really interesting book called Cosmos, and they both have very similar titles. He's not very creative with his titles. You know. The Cosmos and Cosmos. Uh, the subtitles tell much more. And this is written by a colleague at Williams, right? Roberta no. Olson? No, not at Williams. Oh, not Williams. Where New she? York Historical Society. And my New York Historical Society. This is a work of art, and it's about astronomical art. Uh, it's just a phenomenal book. Uh, I've only had a few minutes to see it. There's a truckload of them or a boatload of them coming all the way from overseas. And this will be out uh, hopefully over the summer, right? This new, newest book comes out. This is a compendium of uh, art seen through the lens of science or science seen through the lens of art. Uh, and it, it traces its, its uh, uh, astronomical phenomena and their depiction throughout the centuries through the lens of art. Uh, just a phenomenal book and a testament to just a fraction of Jay's vast intellect. So thank you, Jay, for coming to visit us again. And uh, we look forward to your talk. Well, thank you, Brian. Uh, I have had the pleasure of observing a lot of syzygies, as, as Brian properly put it, uh, including uh, occultations of the sun by the moon, which we call solar eclipses. And I'm going to talk mainly about solar eclipses uh, today, and then at the end I'll go into some other kinds of uh, events that have stemmed from the kinds of instruments that, uh, that we use. Um, I'm spending my sabbatical this semester at the Carnegie Observatories, uh, which is a, a pleasure to be at that uh, institution that we, with which I've long had an interest and association. Uh, I will talk especially about the eclipse of 2017. How many of you saw totality in 2017? Totality. So, uh, uh, yes, so that's all that counts. That's, um, <laughs> And how many are going to see totality in 2024? I expect the rest of the hands to go up at that. At that. If, you, if your hand wasn't up for, for that, it, uh, it, it should be. But I'll talk about the four total eclipses between now and then, too, at, uh, at some point. But in any case, as everyone in this room knows, um, <clears throat> the, uh, it gets a million times darker. So we can see a picture of the moon here, uh, which has uh, the solar corona uh, around it, uh, and uh, and for the preliminary pictures, uh, we need this, these uh, safe solar filters that let only about one part in a hundred thousand or one part in a million of the light of the light through. Let me, oops, I pressed the wrong button. Um, 
and, uh, and then the exciting phenomena that take place at an eclipse when we first see the chromosphere, which is actually what I did my PhD uh, work, uh, work on, at the edge of the sun, I'll say more about that later, uh, and then the corona uh, at the different uh, um, degrees of distance from the sun, a little bit of a solar prominence there, which is a loop of magnetic field that is turned to the edge of the sun, uh, and then as the moon gradually covers the sun, uh, and I'll say more about that too, uh, we get uh, the, some bright light coming through a valley on the edge of the moon, which we call the diamond ring uh, effect, and then the uh, shape of the corona, and you can see here uh, streamers that are going out, uh, controlled by the magnetic field, and also these polar plumes that we now have visible because we're at a minimum of the, uh, of the sunspot cycle, and which for a few years were not visible because there were uh, streamers coming out at all uh, uh, directions. The first person to actually map the path of a solar eclipse and predict its purpose on the, its passage on the Earth was Edmund Halley for the eclipse of, 17, uh, of 1715. And we conclude ye center of ye moon's shade, we very near uh, ye lizard point, et cetera, at the time. And then uh, he actually asked people to ob observe it, and especially the duration of total darkness with all the, the care they can for the situation and dimensions of the shadow to be nicely determined. So this is the origin of citizen science, which we've been pushing in, uh, in recent years. And in fact, um, the, the timing was off uh, some seconds, the distance was off some miles, and he redrew the map uh, with, the, with the actual position and a prediction for the map of 1724 uh, that wound up going over the, uh, the continent. But here in uh, California, not far from here in 1923, there was an eclipse, and for the Naval Observatory expedition to Oregon for 1918, they invited an artist, Henry uh, uh, Howard, Howard Russell Butler, who had uh, a Princeton physics graduate who had worked with Andrew Carnegie uh, to, uh, to paint the eclipse because the film at that time uh, couldn't handle the dynamic range and we didn't have the methods to overcome uh, those limitations the way, we do, uh, the way we do today. So he actually got very interested in uh, in painting the eclipse. He had a method of taking notes in a few minutes. He said, I usually have seven hours of, for a sitting, and now I had to do it all in two minutes. Uh, and of course, the oil was written subsequently. They got interested and uh, did the California eclipse, and, and later an eclipse uh, from Connecticut, and late, still later an eclipse from Maine. And this triptych was over the door of the entrance to the Hayden Planetarium for the American Museum of Natural History, although now it's in storage. Uh, and and uh, Butler uh, did work with uh, Carnegie. Here's a picture that includes Butler and, uh, and Carnegie. He uh, convinced him to make a lake at Princeton that uh, some of you know. And uh, here are the paths of the eclipses that Butler observed uh, with, uh, with 1923, uh, coming very close to, uh, to where we are here. Um, and this uh, eclipse in, 20, uh, in 2017 went very close. Uh, to the, the 1918 path. So for the first time in 99 years, we had a coast-to-coast -coast eclipse, uh, eclipse like that. Some of you may recognize the gentleman with a pipe. So Hubble did things other than, um, than uh, look at galaxies. So for those of you who didn't raise your hand to coming to the 1024 eclipse, if Hubble could do it, you can do it too. Um, at the 1923 eclipse. And Butler went on to paint the prominences, which are uh, gas held by the magnetic field off, uh, off the edge of the sun. Uh, these are in storage at the American Museum of Natural History. And I worked with Steve Padilla, who runs the solar uh, tower now at Mount Wilson, where they have all the back plates uh, uh, going, uh, going back to, in fact, Hale's time in Kenwood Observatory before he came to uh, to California, and we found a number of plates to duplicate the, uh, the, the prominences uh, and other circumstances at, uh, at uh, the total eclipses that Butler, uh, that Butler painted back to 1895 and the ones we've, uh, we've talked about. Uh, and, uh, and so we have these wonderful uh, prominence uh, images from 100 years ago, and you can see uh, here that, that he really did accurately uh, follow the uh, the prominences. Now, one of the things I've been interested in is what we used to call the solar constant, 
the total amount of energy coming from the sun each second, each square centimeter. But it was discovered, as probably everybody in this room knows, that it varies. So it's hard to call it the solar constant if it varies. So now we call it the total solar irradiance, or TSI. And, and uh, NASA and, and ESA have put up a number of instruments that uh, measured the, uh, the, the total solar irradiance. Uh, and you can see uh, how it anti-correlates with the, with the, the uh, sunspot number. And, and uh, at, at the solar minimum, the sun is a little f fainter. It's a little brighter at solar maximum, except then you get some big sunspot groups that eat, that eat in, into that. Uh, and so this is a variation by a tenth of a percent or so. But you can see the calibration differences uh, were much more significant than that. And uh, fortunately, over the last few years, Greg Kopp of the University of Colorado has recalibrated uh, uh, everything. And we now have this, uh, this newer scale. And I'll, and I'll come back to these observations because we've used observations like this to study transits of Venus and transits of Mercury. Uh, and, as Brian said, today is an important anniversary, the 100th anniversary of the total solar eclipse of May 29th, uh, 1919. And uh, Eddington arranged expeditions, and he went to Sobral off the coast of Africa. Uh, he went to Principe, now part of the country of Sao Tome and Principe, off the coast of Africa, uh, near what's now Gabon. And uh, Crumlin and Davidson went to Sobral in Brazil, and the Astronomer Royal uh, Dyson uh, stayed home in England, though he took the main role in, uh, in, reducing, in reducing the data. And this interesting fellow, uh, whose picture you see here, though would, uh, younger at that time, had had the, an interesting idea before 1914 that, uh, that the, uh, sun, uh, the sun's mass would distort space, and the space would make the uh, the uh, starlight ap appear to deviate, and if you traced it back uh, from Earth, you'd think it was uh, slightly deflected. And the closer to the edge of the mass, the edge of the sun, the more the deflection would be, but it would be a tiny amount. And he wrote to George Ellery Hale with this uh, diagram, uh, but at that time, he didn't have the full value uh, uh, calculated there, uh, but he, d he did uh, propose that. and. And Erwin uh, uh, Finley Freundlich, a young German astronomer, went to the eclipse of uh, April of August 21st, 1914. And my wife and I had an article in Space.com about eclipses on August 21st, which include that one and also one viewed by Tycho in 1560, as well as the one in 2017. And as Finley Freundlich and his uh, uh, from Germany crossed into uh, into Russia on the way to Crimea. World War I began, and he was interned. His companions were interned. The equipment was seized. They didn't get the equipment back for many years, and they did not observe the eclipse of 1914, which was fortunate for the history and philosophy of science, because Einstein's prediction was not the full prediction at that time. And in the next couple of years, he doubled his prediction, taking something else into account. And by 1917, he had a, a fuller uh, pr a prediction of 1.75 arc seconds of arc at the edge of the sun, although you can never observe quite to the edge of the sun. And, uh, and Eddington, who was a pacifist, a Quaker, uh, stayed out of the army, and, one, and part of the deal involved, um, in, involved his working on the eclipse in 1919 to test relativity. Um, and the sun in 1919 was in the Hyades, so there were lots of stars, more than usual to uh, to, make, uh, to make this test. Um, so it was unusual for these Englishmen to test the idea of a German scientist right after the war. Uh, and in the very interesting new book by uh, Dan Kenefick, um, uh, that uh, No Shadow of a Doubt, uh, you, that just came out, uh, you can read a lot of the background of, of how the observations were made and how the observations were, uh, were reduced. And they were reduced under the eyes of Dyson, the astronomer royal, Frank Dyson. Uh, so the accusations that Eddington cooked the data are, seem not to be true, though they've been much discussed in recent years. So here is one of the plates uh, from, uh, from uh, 19. This particular plate is now owned by the Niels Bohr Library. And you, it's, you can't really see these particular stars on this, uh, on this plate. But in any case, in November 
1919, there was a joint issue of a joint meeting of the Royal Astronomical Society and the Royal Society at which the results were uh, released and right away around the world there were newspapers uh, uh, hailing this uh, epic-making uh, discovery. British science, uh, British scientist uh, calls the, uh, the discovery one of the greatest of human achievements. Now, we can do a lot better in testing the general theory of relativity in a number of ways, including by deflections, which we now do with radio astronomy and quasars. Uh, and so for a long time, uh, uh, there were no uh, ground-based tests at eclipses of the, um, of the deflection of light. And people like me got annoyed when everybody asked, are you going to test Einstein's theory? Because first of all, didn't need testing. And second, we do different things at eclipses. Now we're studying in particular the outer atmosphere of the sun, which I'll get to uh, in a minute, uh, but there now were at this most recent eclipse a few different uh, uh, tests. So this was released in 2019, but this is the 2017 eclipse. And uh, Richard Berry, former editor of Astronomy Magazine, got these observations with, uh, with these 42 stars, but the corona uh, was too bright and prevented the stars closer to the sun that would have uh, given a bigger deflections. And, uh, the, and the deflection we're measuring is a sub, uh, sub pixel, uh, but this has been, been worked on and they do have uh, a value that, again, endorses Einstein as it must. And uh, Toby Dietrich of uh, Portland State, I believe, uh, had 10 different sites uh, testing this. Eight of them failed for one instrumental reason or another, but he also has some reasonable results. Uh, and uh, uh, Don Bruns, an optical physicist, retired optical physicist, did a very careful set of experiments uh, the, with that also is right on the money, even unbelievably uh, matching Einstein's uh, result. And Brad Schaefer has, uh, has some bigger, shall we say, bigger uncertainty estimates than, uh, than Bruns uh, came out with. So in any case, this is uh, uh, going on. The, the Journal of Quantum Gravity published Bruns's uh, ideas of why that journal is, and whether those referees know what the, how to assess these things is an interesting question. So anyway, uh, we have this great anniversary uh, today, uh, and uh, there are celebrations going on. There's an Eddington uh, Symposium in, uh, in Paris, uh, and on the island of Principe, uh, there, is, uh, there is a, a festival. Uh, I just heard from the current Astronomy Royal today, Martin Rees, who Blur, was kind enough to blurb my text, and he said he actually didn't go, though he was invited to fly down in a plane for a black tie dinner on Principe uh, uh, today. Um, but uh, in any okay, okay. So uh, in any case, if some of you know about 365 Days of Astronomy, um, a website and uh, blog, I have today's piece on this uh, uh, on this anniversary. Anyway, let me go back to, uh, to more modern eclipses, and in particular, for the last uh, half dozen or so years, uh, we had this uh, very nice eclipse that hit, that went very near Principe. I was tempted to go to Principe and row out in a boat for 40 miles or so, but that didn't, wasn't good for the stability of my cameras. So we went on the ground to Gabon. Uh, and we couldn't go right in the center line because we were warned that elephants would come marauding through, so we went to the nearby town of, of uh, Makango Du. Uh, earlier, there had been an eclipse in Australia, and we were able to compare, uh, well, this one here, uh, results from our uh, ground-based site in Australia with, with uh, results from a ship to see uh, motions. And then we do observe with radio telescopes, uh, this was an annular eclipse, but the, most of the radio radiation from the sun comes from the active regions, from the sunspot regions, basically. Uh, and we can get higher resolution even uh, from that at, with the VLA by the uh, uh, occulting and unocculting uh, by the leading edge of the moon. So we are carrying. So, uh, so now we have techniques of computer 
uh, compositing of dozens of images uh, because the sun is, the corona is a thousand times brighter here than here. So taking out that the gradient allows us to see the structure of the corona. And here in 2013, uh, we actually see two coronal mass ejections that were going out, and we could trace those back to imaging on, uh, in the extreme ultraviolet on, on the disk, and there was an erupting prominence here at the same time. And you can see from the streamers uh, all around and the overall uh, symmetrical round uh, axis of the sun that we're at solar maximum. And so we can measure what's called the flattening index, uh, and that's been measured back into the 19th century. Here's an 1896 point, and, uh, and when we're at solar minimum, uh, the sun can be uh, almost 30% elliptical, and at solar maximum, the sun is pretty round, and we had a pretty round eclipse in, uh, in 2013. And I'll get back to that. Uh, and there are some spacecraft up, and, and there are a couple of different spacecraft that observe the, uh, the center of the sun in the extreme ultraviolet. Uh, so this is pasted on what would otherwise be the black uh, image of this side of the moon. Uh, and then, uh, 25 years ago, the European Space Agency launched the uh, Solar and Heliospheric Observatory with a set of coronagraphs run by the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory. Uh, and, uh, and this is rotated 90 degrees from the earlier picture you saw, but here's one of the coronal mass uh, uh, ejections there. And, but this whole donut of, uh, is between the, uh, the EUV here and the, uh, the externally occulted a coronagraph here, and there's even a further uh, a, a coronagraph that occults even more, is only visible in the days of eclipses. So only on the days of total solar eclipses do we get a complete view of the sun. And it's fun when they put one of our composite images as a stronger picture of the day. <clears throat> we did ultimately uh, do some processing and, and, and get these better images uh, of the uh, coronal structure with higher contrast. Uh, and, uh, and then, and then uh, now uh, the uh, NOAA uh, results from the solar ultraviolet imager go a little further out than the everyday surface of the sun, but we're still filling in this, this donut, and we can certainly align the features that we see at higher resolution that we see at eclipses with the lower uh, resolution they have in the, uh, in the uh, uh, coronagraph here. And here's an example of one of our higher resolution images of the coronal mass ejections. So when they're going out to the side like that, uh, they're not going to hit us on Earth, but every once in a while from the spacecraft you see a halo event and then it's coming towards you. And in fact, uh, there are things you can do if you have some notice, such as turning off high voltage in the thousands of satellites going around the Earth and try to save them. Um, and, and Naomi and I were recently at an uh, exhibit at the Science Museum in London where they had Carrington's actual notebook from 1859 when he saw a white light flare. And uh, there was the most tremendous storm with auroras down to low latitudes and uh, the telegraph wires uh, sparking. Um, and if that should happen again, uh, with all our satellites up and our dependence on electricity, things would be a lot, uh, a lot worse. So a lot of effort is going into monitoring uh, the sun and giving notice when there are events on the sun. We also take spectra of the sun. I'll come back to this in a little while. Uh, remember the, what this looks like. This. So here's an overexposed uh, continuum here. Uh, but as the continuum goes away, uh, we get to see these uh, uh, what are called slitless spectra in, the, uh, in this case because the uh, gradient of the uh, solar uh, uh, chromosphere itself uh, acts as a narrow band, so it's dispersed, it acts as its own uh, slit. And in, in 1868, the, um, uh, Janssen discovered that there was a yellow line that was not quite where the sodium D lines were, so we called it uh, D3. And, um, and then eventually Lockyer got a spectrograph a few months later, worked with a chemist named Franklin, and they called it helium. Uh, they said it was from helium because it existed only on the sun. And it took till 1895 till helium was isolated in rocks from, from Earth. And then the next year, in 1869, a green line was seen in the, at an American eclipse by Harkness and Young. And they called that coronium, said it must come from coronium because it exists only in the corona. 
And this is the International Year of the Periodic Table. Uh, you can uh, uh, learn all about that from my wife's crossword puzzle in the latest issue of Physics Today for celebrating the International Year of the Periodic Table or at our website at solarcorona.com, and you can link to her crossword. But in any case, everybody here knows that there is no element called coronium, and it took from 1869 until the early 1940s until it was realized that this line is from 13 times ionized iron, and it has to be millions of degrees for, uh, uh, for the uh, iron to be that ionized. There's an iron 10 line uh, in the red here, um, th a nine times ionized iron, and, um, uh, and we study over the solar cycle the ratio of intensity of iron 14 to iron 10, and the, uh, at, at solar maximum, the corona is a little hotter, and we can actually see the green line brighter than the red line, and that reverses at, uh, at solar minimum. So we have a series uh, of that, and these we made from Gabon in, uh, in 2013. Uh, here is the sunspot cycle, uh, and, uh, and you can see the peak here. Uh, the different hemispheres peaked at slightly different times, and we're now really uh, coming into solar minimum here, and you can see the spacecraft that have been up Soho all this time, and, uh, and now the Solar Dynamics Observatory more recently, and now the solar panels on uh, GOES spacecraft, the uh, Earth mapping spacecraft from NOAA, are looking, uh, are looking at the sun while the cameras, the main cameras, are looking down at the Earth. But now NOAA is mounting um, solar telescopes in, uh, alongside the solar panels, so there's a new sequence of, uh, of solar telescope and the GOES-16 and GOES-17 to, uh, to monitor the, uh, the sun. Let me uh, go ahead to a total solar eclipse that threaded the Atlantic, barely hitting the Faroe Islands, missing Greenland and Iceland, but going right over Svalbard, which is controlled by Norway, halfway to the North Pole. You can see how, how elongated the shadow was at this point uh, around the curvature of the top of the, of the Earth. And we went to Longyear Bien, the capital of, Sval of Svalbard, and we got these excellent observations. You can see that it's not quite symmetrical anymore. We're going past solar maximum, working with a New York musician, Wendy Carlos, who's putting together some of these images that look more like what the eye uh, puts, uh, puts together. Uh, and I'll come back to the use of an image from the most recent eclipse uh, made with Wendy uh, and uh, joint publication with Zoran Mikic, who is here at Predictive Science, Inc. Uh, from, uh, from San Diego, and I'll come back to this with the 2017 eclipse. But here's our joint image from the 2013 uh, eclipse. Uh, here, uh, with time lapse, um, uh, well, speed it up a factor of 10. You can see the shadow uh, go by. We were out on the ice because, I'll go back and do that again, we had to get past these mountains because the sun had to clear the mountains. But if you went further out than two kilometers from Long Urbien, you had to have a rifle to protect yourself from the polar bears. So we were located just under that, uh, uh, that level uh, there. And only one tourist we know of got mauled by polar bears, but he was way out uh, beyond where he was supposed to be. Um, so we had these excellent observations in 2015 uh, uh, from, uh, from uh, Svalbard. And oops, uh, let's see, and and uh, and you can see here the coronal green line uh, very well. Uh, for example, we're closer to solar maximum there. And here you see the sodium lines. So here's D1 and D2, the sodium D lines, and I'm, I meant to say the yellow lines. And then here's D3, which you see is much brighter, and that is the helium, uh, the helium line, the basic uh, visible helium line. But the helium uh, has to be excited to a higher temperature than we get in the photosphere to be obvious, so, uh, so we see that uh, as well as uh, infrared line at 10 a 30 in, uh, from, the, uh, from the chromosphere. Here's the coronal green line uh, over, over there. And the red line is fainter, and because it's a slitless spectra, we get full, uh, full uh, circles from the coronal lines and only crescents one, facing one way or the other from the chromospheric lines. Uh, we are, I'm working with an atmospheric physicist, Marcos Peñaloza Murillo from Venezuela, uh, and we have uh, temperature measuring devices. So it was two degrees Fahrenheit 
in the morning, and when the sun came up, it went all the way up to 8 degrees, and then the moon started covering the sun, and the temperature went down to minus 7, uh, and you see there's some thermal lag after the center of, uh, of totality before it resumed what it would have done had it been a normal day at that location, that the sky was very clear. And we have uh, published in the Phil Tran to the Royal Society about the observation of this eclipse that had a special issue, especially of the effect of the partial phases throughout, uh, throughout Europe, and my article on the, t on the total phases, and uh, we've published since on other uh, eclipses and the meteorological effect of eclipses when there's an abrupt shock to the Earth's atmosphere of cutting off the sunlight. The next two eclipses that were total went across Indonesia in 2016, and then, of course, the American one. Uh, and in 2016, we were at uh, the island of Ternate, and it was pretty cloudy, but there were holes in the clouds, and we were fortunate to see all the phenomena through the holes in the clouds, a nice prominence there, uh, for example. <clears throat> I am the chair of the working group of eclipses of the International Astronomical Union, so we have people from all over the world to help coordinate uh, the eclipses and help with visas and, and shipping and various, and various things. And we've just added people from Argentina and Chile because of the locations of the next two eclipses to help us. And then we have people who do actual calculations uh, and, and mapping and, and a website with mapping. Uh, and Jay Anderson does uh, uh, cloudiness statistics. Uh, and uh, Glenn Schneider calculates aircraft uh, trajectories. And Michael Gill runs uh, solar eclipse mailing list, in which we all keep in touch, and these other people are, are mappers, or, or uh, Mike Kentrinakis was in charge of the uh, AAS uh, uh, task force. And Ralph Chow does important things about eye safety. So in 2017, uh, the uh, eclipse went uh, uh, coast to coast across the United States for the first time since 1918, as you saw. So we were in Salem. Uh, there, and of course the partial phases covered the whole country, and the weather statistics were better in the west, so most of us went to the west. It just tipped Kansas City and St. Louis at the, at the edge. Uh, it was a little cloudier in that, in that period and went out to sea uh, near uh, Charleston, uh, South uh, Carolina, and, and then ended at the Atlantic in, uh, in sunset, and tens of millions of, of Americans uh, saw that uh, uh, south saw that eclipse, um, and, uh, and we have these wonderful uh, images. Uh, Alan Slisky is coming uh, with me next, uh, next month, so we'll see what prominences uh, there are, but here's beautiful uh, features in, a, in a, a prominence at the edge of the uh, sun uh, during the, uh, the eclipse. Uh, and a composite image at high contrast um, made with uh, some uh, colleagues, Wojta Rusin, Roman, Roman Venur, uh, and in our recent Nature Astronomy article, Zorin used uh, Druckmuller's similar uh, high contrast uh, imaging, but we also have our own capabilities of, of doing this, this high contrast imaging. And we'll discuss, won't we, what, who, which images we'll use for a similar paper from the, from the forthcoming uh, eclipse. But we're certainly very pleased with, with the quality. The sky was, was gorgeous and clear, uh, with beautiful polar plumes. Uh, you can really see the three-dimensional porcupine structure projected uh, back on the plane of the, uh, of the sky. Uh, so we're really very pleased with what we have from the 2017 uh, eclipse. Uh, we were there in, uh, in Salem as, uh, as the eclipse path went over, but it turns out if you actually calculate the shadow, um, the shadow is not actually elliptical uh, because the, the uh, it turns out that the irregularities at the edge of the moon have to do with the projection of the shadow on the Earth, uh, and then it interacts with the, the mountainscape on the surface uh, on the surface of the Earth. So uh, we have uh, so uh, we actually have uh, results uh, about the uh, the details of the predictions having to do with the shape of the moon that's now been measured from the Lunar Reconnaissance Observatory from NASA and the Kagoya spacecraft from from Japan. Uh, I do travel not only with scientific uh, colleagues from all over, uh, but also with students from Williams College. We had eight students from, uh, from Williams uh, and, uh, and four of our alumni who are uh, astronomers or graduate, uh, graduate uh, students on that occasion. We were set up at Willamette University uh, with a whole lot of, uh, of apparatus uh, at, uh, at, uh, at, that t uh, at that time. 
and is very good for us all. And through the IAU, we also uh, had, uh, had some 50 Japanese astronomers and 28 Chinese astronomers who joined us on the, uh, on the site. The day was completely clear, and, uh, and we just had a beautiful diamond ring and nice prominences, and, uh, and then here's the, the uh, inner corona. I did have a Scientific American article to orient uh, uh, people across the country, uh, and, and let me just use a little bit of the orientation that, of, of course, here we all know the surface of the star is closer to uh, 6,000 uh, kelvins, uh, but then there's some energy input, and the, and the chromosphere is, uh, uh, is perhaps 10 times hotter than that on the, on the whole. The prominences are chromospheric level gas at 60,000 degrees or so, but then energy is injected into the, into the corona, and you have to not only inject it, but also make it stay there to heat the corona to millions of degrees. Of course, it's, it's a low, very low density, so it doesn't take much energy to make the particles go, uh, go very fast. And I have been saying for a long time that uh, there have been, that the problem of just how the corona is heated to million degrees has been solved, that it's been solved by 12 different people in 12 different ways. Uh, and then at a meeting of the AAAS, it's which Steve Cranmer from um, uh, Boulder uh, spoke last year, he actually listed 19 different solutions. So it's uh, a major uh, unsolved problem in astrophysics, which of the models of the heating of the corona is correct, and some of what we're doing is testing, um, uh, is uh, trying to make observations that, that distinguish uh, between the results of, of different theories. In particular, by making power spectra of high frequency uh, observations in the, sp in the limited coronal lines, which is not what everybody sees. Most people don't have these, these uh, coronal, uh, coronal filters. Uh, so we, we take advantage of, of the days of eclipses to carry out uh, these, uh, these observations. And here is uh, one of our starting picture of the day uh, images from a month after the eclipse. And you can see how there, there were very few streamers at that, at that time coming at the solar minimum. You could see the polar plumes. Uh, you can see our uh, fill-in of the donut that is within the occulting disk here. On the uh, ultraviolet image, um, uh, then uh, from the Solar Dynamics Observatory, you can see that there was a coronal hole here, a low density, uh, low, relatively low temperature region of the corona in this uh, extreme ultraviolet uh, uh, image. But it is a real effect. If you're looking down with a weather satellite, you can actually see the shadow of the moon uh, cross, uh, cross the Earth. If you were on the moon, as, uh, and this is a robotic observer, the Lunar Reconnaissance Observatory uh, orbiter uh, could, see, uh, could see the shadow. And if you were an astronaut, you could just stick your camera up to the glass and, uh, and see, the, uh, see the corona. I would love to see that someday. Um, uh, see the shadow, the umbra here. And I worked with Ernie Wright of uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, program. Uh, and we took our, our uh, timed observations of the, of the Bailey's beads here at the, at the edge of the sun in ingress and egress. And uh, because now we have uh, detailed three-dimensional mapping of the shape of the corona, of the shape of the edge of the moon. And you can get the libration right and make the predictions right. And so the variable is really then just the size of the sun. And we have a small deviation that we recommend to the IAU for the size of the sun they use in the model for, uh, for uh, predictions. Um, in any case, to get back to the heating of the corona, here from my Scientific American article, here's a drawing of a coronal loop. And it could just be that there are nano flares going off all the, all the time on the sun, very small uh, flare-like uh, objects. Or we could have alpha N waves bouncing back and forth, which normally would take seconds or tens of seconds, or there could be surface alpha N waves, uh, which give uh, sub-second uh, periods. And so we are working on, uh, on making measurements in the coronal lines and taking out the, uh, the uh, variations from the atmosphere. I've been working in particular with Mike Person of, uh, of MIT. We have uh, here uh, indoor frame transfer cameras that we use for our occultation studies. And here we have a red line and a green line. Uh, a filter, and, and we made these observations uh, at, at, three, uh, at three hertz um, in, 
uh, in Salem, and we're still studying those data. We do have some spectra some, uh, from uh, earlier uh, observations, earlier eclipses, that, that do tend to favor some extra power at short, uh, at short uh, frequencies. At, uh, but uh, uh, we, we still are working on these, on these data here. So here's a sample red line and green line uh, image. You can see a little structure, and of course, uh, th that will come out more as we study it in, uh, in detail. Uh, and we were observing this region on the edge of the sun uh, with the GOES-16 image in the background here. Um, here's a combination my student, Christian Lockwood, made uh, combined with the uh, extreme ultraviolet from, uh, from GOES-SUVI. Uh, uh, and we can really see the polar plumes and the, and the streamers. And the sky was so clear, we can really see the streamers much further out than the last scale coronagraph, and we have much higher resolution. So we do what we can in the overlap, in the overlap regions. And then a colleague observe, uh, observed from Carbon de Illinois, which was 65 minutes later in the passage, and you can actually see some features here, for example, uh, moving quite a distance in only one hour. Uh, and you can see changes in, in, in some of the uh, plumes here. Uh, and variations in, uh, in the uh, streamers and the fine structure of the streamers. So we are busy studying the dynamics of the corona and measuring the velocities that, that occur there in the, uh, in the sun. So here we are in the uh, current part of the sunspot cycle. Uh, the yellow are the daily observations. You can see that most days there's nothing on the sun uh, at all. So I can't even predict whether there'll be any sunspots on July 2nd for the forthcoming eclipse. Uh, and then we expect there to be some, some rise, but it's been controversial just what the next spot will be. Are there some longer periods in addition to the 11 uh, year, uh, year period? What's going to happen next? And, uh, uh, and David Hathaway just and a panel of experts just made some, some predictions, and it might be another low cycle in the next time, but there's some possibility there'll be no cycle at all, uh, or at least not in visible spots, and uh, different people have different predictions. But this is the latest committee uh, result, another, another low cycle coming up. Uh, we do have the, uh, the spectra from, uh, together made with my colleague Aris Volgaris from, uh, from Greece uh, here. Uh, the iron uh, 14 uh, green line, faintly visible there. Here's the, here's the uh, red line, a little stronger at this phase in the sunspot cycle. And here's the helium line, for example, with a little bit of sodium there, H, uh, H beta, H alpha uh, there. And, uh, and then we have these, uh, uh, these images in the coronal red line and the coronal green line. Uh, and, uh, and we can see the, the different structure and the temperature structure as it varies with position in the, uh, in the corona. Uh, here's a little more magnified. Here's the coronal red line. So these are all from the 2017 uh, eclipse um, uh, made uh, there, and here's, and here's the green line, higher dispersion spectrograph. So we will have those spectrographs on the top of Sarah Tololo, uh, as uh, I was awarded uh, one of the five observing spots at, uh, in Sarah Tololo for the eclipse that's uh, coming, and of course we've scanned the lines, uh, the lines there in the red and green line and seeing the orientation to where it is in the solar, in the solar corona. And then, much fainter than the, than the red line and the green line is an argon-10 line. And I've borrowed a LEO filter, a high quality calcite uh, series of filter uh, of high purity from the Big Bear Solar Observatory. And Aris Vulgaris has modified it uh, to the argon-10 uh, wavelength. Uh, which is a weaker line, but we expect to get the first high-quality imaging of Argon-10 at the eclipse that's coming in about five, uh, five weeks. So, so here it is in a slitless uh, spectrum, but we hope to have more detail than that uh, next, uh, next month. Uh, and you can see here the actual spectral line is just, is just weaker, but we do have this uh, capability now. And we are working today even in shipping it from Greece to to uh, Chile. Um, Brian is an expert in getting equipment into, uh, into Chile, and so we're working on that. Anyway, uh, using one of these uh, GOES-16 uh, images with our image in a, to make a, a compound, here you can see uh, this uh, solar minimum situation in 2017, and we expect it to look somewhat similar in, uh, in, 20, 
19. Uh, just to remind you what happens at, at solar maximum, this is an old image from 20 years ago at solar maximum when there are uh, uh, streamers all around, uh, at including high latitudes. So, but now we're at solar minimum. And so, in fact, uh, here is the, uh, the 2016 point, about halfway down, and then the 2017 uh, uh, flattening index is up around a, a quarter. With Marcos Pendulosa Murillo and uh, Michael Roman and my uh, senior who just graduated, Ross Yu from Williams College, we have observations of the uh, winds and, and, and here's the radiation all, uh, all going away here. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and well, here we see the wind die down and, the, and uh, during, uh, during totality. Uh, and, uh, and we can see the atmospheric pressure at the onset of the, uh, of the eclipse. And here's a change in the wind speed. Uh, and the solar radiation, of course, went to zero uh, over there. And you can see the dip in the temperature. Uh, so we'll be making measurements like that uh, again uh, this year. And Ross worked with weather stations across the country, inside and outside of totality, for his senior thesis. Uh, so in any case, we're very happy with what we had from 2017. I was very pleased to work with uh, Zorin, who's here, and his colleagues, Connor Down, John Linker, and they uh, use uh, satellite measurements of the magnetic field for the preceding month or so uh, to make a prediction of what the corona uh, looks like, uh, will look like, and this was released uh, before, the, uh, before the eclipse, about a week before the eclipse, and you can see the streamers that they predicted and the plumes that they predicted. And I'm pleased that one of our, our uh, uh, smooth uh, images uh, made with Wendy Carlos was used to compare uh, with, uh, with their prediction. And you can see the results are actually uh, quite, uh, quite in agreement. Uh, here, in fact, is the diagram from the Nature Astronomy uh, article with, uh, and a higher uh, resolution. So here's our image from, uh, from Salem. And here's a composite image with a higher contrast made by uh, Milislav Druckmuller with uh, observations from uh, Peter Aniol and Shadia uh, Habal. And here are their, their predictions here and the predicted magnetic feed lines, predicted polarized brightness. So we look forward to doing that again uh, next month. And so it's, it's uh, less than four weeks from today that we'll get their prediction and about five weeks till we get the observations. Uh, Yiming Wang of NRL also makes some magnetic field uh, calculations. Uh, and uh, we can see where there was a the helmet streamer, and, and I don't have time to go into any detail, but the active region at the east ring, uh, east uh, uh, limb, and, and so here's our, our uh, composite, and we can link, th and we can link, that, all, uh, link that all up uh, here with those predictions. Uh, and then uh, you can look uh, to see what the sun would look, be like in 3D if you look from the east or you look, or you look from the west, uh, and NASA has a, a, a pair of spacecraft, Stereo, of which one is still operating, that is partway around the uh, Earth's orbit. So we get actually a three-dimensional view, a stereo view. I just got these spectra from Richard Berry, uh, the former editor of Astronomy Magazine, just to show you the, the, uh, what slitless spectra are like. And just at the origin, uh, a beginning of, of uh, what we call second contact, there'll be some overexposed continuum that will go away. Uh, and, you, and you can see those, uh, those uh, uh, chromospheric lines in the, slit, in the slitless spectrum uh, and, uh, and totality. And then it comes out the other side. You can see the individual spectra of the, uh, of the prominences and then, and then the uh, bits of chromosphere uh, uh, and bits of uh, photosphere emerge from, uh, the, from the Bailey's beads. Uh, and so here are all the labels, but you can see the... Uh, the, uh, well, the prominence images there, uh, and you can see uh, here the helium, uh, uh, some helium there and some sodium there, and, and, uh, and so th there are a lot of chromospheric lines. We have used the expanded Owens Valley Solar Array with Dale Gary especially of uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology, and the blue is the model of the advance of the moon, and you can see uh, when the active region is covered over and uncovered, and so we get very accurate positions, so we, and we can correlate those with the X-ray uh, uh, observations from the sun. 
and my uh, alumnus, uh, Mujo Lu, drew the, drew the uh, VLA from when we were at the VLA with something similar in 2012. And we did use the VLA again uh, this, uh, this time. And uh, here's a solar dynamics observatory background. But we did have an active region that we could, uh, that we could study. And here's how far we get in one minute. So by taking uh, uh, observations every second or so, you can see the high resolution that we, uh, that we get. So these are VLA radio contours at 2.8 gigahertz, uh, for example. So, um, so we've been working with these uh, VLA uh, data to, to uh, pinpoint the, where the radio mission comes from. Uh, and there is a radio telescope uh, that's a, from an ESA uh, tracking station in Argentina that we'll be using for the next two eclipses. And we have arrangements with ESA and the people there to make those observations. I did help propose this mega movie where we had citizen science all across the country, uh, led by Hugh Hudson, uh, especially of uh, Berkeley. Uh, and, uh, and finally, there was this big mega movie project. And there are, th are thousands of uh, uh, over a thousand contributors. And we have as a, a big archive online to uh, to work with, and that will be even more elaborate in 2024. And then I mentioned the Stereo A, uh, and, uh, and here's the position of the Earth, but Stereo Advanced is ahead of the Earth's orbit from this different point of view, and, and B has failed now, but, but, uh, but we do have these observations that we can match up with the theoretical uh, predictions from, from the sides. Uh, and I mentioned uh, the solar ultraviolet imager. This is not during the eclipse, but you can see the quality of the observations, the coronal hole there, the uh, eruptions that we, uh, that we see. So we will have the data again from GOES 16 and uh, 17 for this eclipse. And the GOES sequence is funded by NOAA and should be uh, working for at least 20, 20 years. I do have a website as I finish the part of my talk about the eclipse. Uh, at totalsolareclipse.org with the 70 different eclipses that I, solar eclipses that I have observed. And for the IAU, we run a website at eclipses.info, so that's just an easy URL to uh, r remember. And we have links to various mapping. And then uh, I had a resource letter in the American Journal of Physics with all kinds of references to eclipse-related things, including the relativity. Uh, and, and there was one for the International Year of Astronomy. Uh, and uh, in 2009, and then we updated that uh, for the American Journal of Physics and then uh, Nature uh, Astronomy um, for all kinds of, of uh, articles. Now, um, <clears throat> I had a little withdrawal in 2018 because there was no total or annular eclipse anywhere in the world in 2018. So there were uh, three uh, partial eclipses. So Naomi and I went to Buenos Aires for a 16% eclipse in in, uh, in February, which was, which was very nice. And of course, I get to practice uh, with some equipment and check on things and, uh, and uh, do some public outreach. Here we are on the roof of a hotel in Buenos Aires. And then in, on July 13th, the eclipse was over Antarctica and extended to, uh, to just barely to Melbourne. And we went to Tasmania, uh, where we were at the grounds of the Mount Pleasant Radio Observatory. Um, and, uh, and got uh, beautiful uh, observations. And, uh, and I learned a lot about pulsars from a Vela glitch that they had observed. And, uh, and then on August 11th, we went to uh, Stockholm. Uh, and here's a ground-based observation from, from Stockholm. The weather was bad further north, where there was a deeper eclipse. And here's the uh, spacecraft uh, uh, view of that eclipse. Uh, and then early in 2019, there was an eclipse that it did reach Alaska, but uh, very low in the, in the sky. Uh, so I went to uh, Tokyo for, uh, for that eclipse, uh, which was really very interesting to do. And I got to work with my colleague, Dr. Hanaoka, who uh, uh, will be near, near me on Saratololo for the uh, forthcoming uh, eclipse. And Dr. Hie is a, a noted uh, Japanese uh, solar astronomer, and others are observers there, and a colleague. Um, and then sometimes there are just eclipses that don't reach us on Earth. The GOES-16 had an extra uh, partial eclipse. Uh, and you have to know about these things because the Yoko spacecraft from Japan actually was surprised by one and it spun out of control and died. 
And that's one of the few negative things I know about eclipses. But you have to make sure that there's no eclipse that's going to sneak up on your, on your spacecraft uh, here. Uh, and that particular eclipse um, you, uh, uh, was uh, really a, a quite a substantial thing. Anyway, uh, in a month or so, in July 2nd, 2019, there's an eclipse that goes over the Pacific. Uh, near sunset, it reaches the uh, Pacific coast of uh, Chile, and uh, we intend to observe from the center line right, uh, right here uh, at, this, uh, at this location, and then it uh, ends at sunset over in Argentina. We want to get as high as possible from, uh, from land there. It only crosses one island, a little island in the middle of the Pacific, Owino Island. Cerro Tololo is in the path of totality, a little off center, but, uh, but still uh, gets more than two minutes of, uh, of totality. And I have, as I, as I mentioned, uh, observing slots for four of our team there. Las Campanas is just off the edge, so those poor people have to descend from the mountain and travel into totality to, uh, uh, to see it. Uh, so in 2019, the eclipse ends here after the Pacific. In 2020, in the summertime, the eclipse central point is actually in Argentina. And so on that occasion, we've arranged to be uh, on the coast uh, here. And then O'Brien is working for, to also have some people in, in Chile uh, so they can visit his uh, Simons Observatory uh, afterward. Uh, but, but here we go through... Uh, through lower, lower Chile in the peak here, and we'll be in Las Grutas right on the coast on the center line on December 14th, 2020, in the summertime there. Uh, and then um, in 2023, there'll be an annular eclipse uh, from uh, Texas to uh, Oregon, and so you'll get a pretty deep uh, a partial eclipse uh, here in, uh, in San Diego, uh, actually a better partial eclipse than, than for the total eclipse that will go from Mexico to Texas to uh, Cleveland to New England in 2024. Uh, and so this annular eclipse uh, in 2023 uh, uh, goes over the western part of the United States. And uh, 2024, uh, the weather is usually better in April in Texas than it is in New England, so I'm anticipating being there, but we're uh, looking at the cloudiness statistics. So uh, we just had this very exciting uh, time. Uh, at, the, uh, at the eclipse in, uh, in 2017. Um, we don't have sound, but the people are starting to cheer at this point. You can see the shadow uh, over, uh, overtake the, the Earth. You can actually see far enough away that it's a little bright in the horizon because we're seeing 100 miles away, and we have uh, totality uh, there. And, uh, and it just worked very, very well. Anybody want to guess what this is? Mars. Mars. So this is an eclipse of the sun by Phobos from Mars, recently sent down from the Curiosity uh, spacecraft. And there's actually a song that goes with it from Sean Lennon, the monolith of Phobos I just learned about, which I won't play here. Uh, and, uh, but you can actually see the sky darken from the, uh, from the eclipse from uh, from Curiosity, and, uh, and then Deimos. So there are these eclipses of the sun, which are almost like, uh, like transits, uh, if you happen to be on Mars. And of course, the resolution is not as good, but that's still pretty good for Mars. Uh, I want to take just a few minutes, now that we're almost finished, um, for some observations we made of other things that go in front of the sun beside the moon. Uh, oops. Uh, so. Mercury is a, just a little thing, smaller than a sunspot. And, uh, uh, but from the Big Bear Solar Observatory in California, where I had the good fortune to be a postdoc many years ago, uh, we can get these really high, high resolution observations. This is really very impressive of Mercury going in front of the solar, uh, of the solar granulation. And so this is what we did in 2016 at the transit of Mercury. And we look forward to doing this again on uh, November uh, 11th uh, uh, this year. And uh, as a student exercise, I worked with some people in Germany, as well as Glenn Schneider, an article on the physics teacher in, in measuring the parallax of uh, measurements from, uh, from Germany and from, and from California. Uh, and uh, the sharper images are ours from Big Bear, of course. Um, 
but, uh, but we can uh, measure that, uh, that parallax effect, and that's a good student uh, observation. And we also measured the, the uh, sodium tail of, of mercury, but we have observations also from Sacramento Peak that we're also arranging for uh, this coming November. Um, the total solar uh, irradiance does drop by 1%, and that we could measure. This was the active cavity radiometer and radiance measurement uh, de uh, device uh, uh, that was aloft on its own, uh, on its own spacecraft that's no longer uh, working. Uh, but for mercury, it's a much smaller, uh, it's a much smaller effect. Uh, and, and this was from a spacecraft from Greg Kopp, uh, the so-called uh, total irradiance measurement on the source, NASA's source spacecraft. And so here is the 2012 uh, Venus transits. So the Venus transits are easy in total solar irradiance, um, but Venus itself is big enough on the surface of the sun that you can even see it with, barely with your eye if you're just looking through a solar uh, solar filter, whereas Mercury is much smaller. So we have been following this along. Here's the 2004 transit of, of Venus and the 2012 transit of Venus. Uh, and, uh, and then we did, uh, but we weren't satisfied with just these two transits of Venus. If you happen to be on Jupiter, uh, there was then a transit of Venus uh, a couple of months later, uh, and we managed to get a full day of 14 orbits of the, of the Hubble Space Telescope to study Jupiter to see if we could see it drop by a hundredth of a percent in intensity from the transit of, uh, of Venus. Uh, and these are related to exoplanet transits and the limit of what you can, what you can measure. So we do have these great uh, uh, in two-color observations, hundreds of, of individual frames, but, but uh, the brightness of Jupiter, because of its clouds, varied by 3%, and we were actually unable to pick up the hundredth of a percent variation on the variation of the 3% of the background. Uh, uh, but, but since we had uh, 14 orbits and 170 exposures of Hubble, uh, we could see the great red spot. Uh, we were able to uh, use that together with Theodora Carolidi, Daniel Apai, and, and uh, some others to uh, test um, uh, some uh, code for mapping uh, brown dwarf atmospheres and finding spots on, on exoplanets. And so we were able to get uh, some useful AppJ Ap article out of that. Uh, here's here's our, uh, our discussion there. I won't dwell on, on this. And then, uh, and then uh, we, we couldn't see it just, uh, nothing was going on from the, uh, from the Earth, but from in a few months later, there was a transit of, uh, of a Venus as seen from, from um, Cassini, and, uh, uh, and, we, and we tried to work with the Cassini people, and we got a marginal detection in the most sensitive infrared channel, and this again is a limit on what the exoplanet people can uh, can hope to uh, see, because we're seeing the detail of what goes on. Uh, and, then, uh, and then just quickly, um, for the 2003 Mercury transit uh, and the 2006 Mercury transit, because there are over a dozen Mercury transits per century, and this was the one in 2016, and now we're looking to uh, 2019, November 11th. The transit will be in progress in sunrise here in California. It will be fully visible in the eastern United States and the Canary Islands, uh, and, uh, and we'll try to make some comparisons uh, there. Uh, and then really just to uh, finish, uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes, uh, I've used our high-speed imaging that you saw with the red and green lines without a filter, starting with my colleague Jim Elliott at MIT to uh, study occultations of stars by Pluto and other objects. And just before New Horizons went by, um, we, uh, we did get a light curve from the Mount John Observatory including the central flash from focusing uh, because we were just in the right spot to, uh, to image the, the stars that went behind, uh, be, uh, behind uh, the, uh, well, the occulting uh, object, Pluto. Uh, and uh, there were observations from uh, Las Campanas also uh, here. Uh, and as you know, uh, when Pluto went, uh, when New Horizons went by, uh, it turns out two Pluto days, which is 12 Earth days later, we got these wonderful images of Pluto and Charon. Here they are really with the distance to scale. And then Mark Bowie found three objects, uh, picking them out of a star field, 
that the spacecraft was going more or less straight at, because we've got a nice spacecraft out there with a lot of instruments, and if you can find something that it can get to with the amount of fuel it has, that's worth doing. So on January 1st, this year, the spacecraft w went to one of those objects, 2014 MU69. From the 2014, you can tell that it was only discovered in 2014, and they therefore didn't know precisely enough where it was to go only 2,000 miles from it. So there were three occultations of the object, and I participated in the team with our instrumentation, with, well, our methods and their instrumentation of June 3rd, 2017, and then Sophia flew uh, in the middle of July, and there was another occultation further south. Uh, you see, so we're almost matching the eclipse paths uh, here uh, in, uh, in 2017. And, uh, and the, f the first time, we had flat light curves, uh, and, uh, and didn't pick up the object, which was just off the, uh, off the edge, uh, but uh, the, we had the, the Gaia catalog, and uh, a lot of careful work was done. And finally, in 2017, and I didn't go because it was closer to the eclipse, 23 stations uh, worked with 16-inch telescopes that NASA had bought, and they got five occultation cords. Uh, uh, so here's where my team here for 2014 MU69 and under the southern, uh, the, under the beautiful southern sky, uh, where we, we did get uh, in clear sky these observations that, uh, that didn't show uh, uh, a dip. But in 20, uh, July 17th, uh, every 10 kilometers or so, there was a, a picket fence uh, to, uh, to pick up the, uh, the images. And there were these five uh, occultations of half second to a uh, second and a half. Uh, and uh, and it, it showed it wasn't round and gave this, uh, this strange shape, which could have been duplicated by a binary object. And, uh, and the idea was that there really might be a binary object out there, but whether it was contact or whether it was orbiting uh, was, uh, was not known. Um, but when the observations were actually finally made, you can see that it really is a binary object stuck together. You've all seen uh, some of these pictures. It's only 21 miles across. It's known as Ultima Thule from an old uh, name from a couple of thousand years ago for something beyond the far north. Uh, and there's a, a little brighter in the neck, and the albedo's between around 6 and, a, and 12 percent or, or so, and, uh, and the data are still coming back. There's a camera with a lower resolution that gives color uh, information to give the, the uh, composites uh, there. And then as the spacecraft came by at 32,000 miles an hour, uh, it really uh, um, gave great observations, and, but also explained why the light curve didn't vary, because it was uh, more or less a pinwheel with the axis pointing, uh, pointing at us. Uh, and, uh, and so there are the, just uh, the finest resolution as it came close, and they really did a wonderful job in pinpointing it, because we had these occultation observations, and I'm very pleased and proud to have participated in, uh, in those studies. And then they had this idea that it was, well, we called even a snowman of these two primitive objects from 4.6 billion years ago uh, that have been unaltered for all this time, 33 kilometers or so uh, across uh, here. And here's the highest resolution observations when it, uh, when it came back. But then it turns out they sent back the data from when the spacecraft passed by and looked back and occulted stars. And from that, they could reconstruct the three-dimensional view. And the three-dimensional view turned out not to be two primitive round objects, uh, but uh, rather uh, one, one flattened, one indented uh, like that, which was a surprise. And, and so now, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a science article with these uh, first results. And it's really just fabulous. It's really just fabulous stuff, and it's a lot of fun. And it uh, uses the kind of instrumentation that we've been using to study models for the coronal heating. And so that's what I have to say on uh, the, uh, the eclipses and a few other things. And I thank you very much, and I thank Brian for inviting me.